we've done this the last couple of years. We have this thing we call the Great Debate, and we pick a topic. And this year, just so I get it exactly right, the topic is antivirus and monthly security patching should be abandoned in ICS. And we uh, put out a call and we ask for one of the attendees to take the pro condition or the pro position that it should be abandoned, someone to take the con position that it should not be abandoned, and make the most compelling argument they can. So th just to be clear, the arguments they're making are not necessarily their point of views. They are advocates for the position. And they may, when we get into the discussion, they may take completely the opposite side. I don't know. But, but uh, I, I've asked them to say, you know, make the best possible case you can. So they're going to take uh, five minutes, ten minutes tops and, and make their case pro and con. And then we'll throw it open to the floor. And that's when we need you to participate like you just are. And we'll have you on mic then because we'll, we'll record the great debate. So we're going to start out with Billy Rios. And you are arguing that they should be should patch. Definitely. Um, I'm Billy Rios. I'm going to be arguing that we should patch. I had a, like a Prezi style presentation, but I converted it to PowerPoint. So there'll be a couple weird slides in here, but please forgive me. Um, why? You know, I think people should question everything, including that sign right there. So no matter what points I bring up, I expect people to question and ask why. You know? um, and I think we're beyond the point of just saying, hey, we're evolving. Everything is becoming automated. Uh, we're already there. If you don't think we're there, I think you're very naive. But um, of course, question everything, right? <clears throat> but that is an assumption that I'm making right now. Um, and I'm going to be basing my argument on two things. The first one I call opportunity, and the second one I call pain, right? Things that people should understand. So first, uh, opportunity. So that's me. And that's Reed, and that's Aaron, that's Terry. And this is what we do, right? And you're not going to stop us. And we're rel relentless. And there is no end for us. Because when we finish one, we go to the next one. We go to the next one. And we always tell ourselves that we're not going to do this, but we always end up doing this, right? Every day, every night, every week, it just doesn't stop, right? <clears throat> and we have different motivations, right? So at the end of those long, long, long nights, we have some deliverable or some product that we have. And maybe our motivation is to get more Twitter followers to the point where everyone loves us. <laughs> we go to crowds and everyone cheers. We're just the most awesome person on the planet, right? But there's other people that have other motivations, right? And people are motivated by a lot of different things. And not everyone's going to go for Twitter followers, right? <clears throat> but the thing is, is that we're all going to wait for our opportunity. And our opportunity is going to come at your cost, right? And for some reason, people think the way we take advantage of our opportunity is this very, very gentle slope that you can see coming in the distance, that you know is coming, that comes very slowly. But in reality, it's a hard, hard Josh, right? Like, when, when we seize the moment to take advantage of our opportunity, it's going to come at you very, very, very hard and fast. There's going to be no notice, and it's going to hurt, right? Which brings us to our next point here, right? Pain. So I was once the security program manager for Internet Explorer. It's a very, very small product. You probably never heard of it. But uh, I was the security PM. <clears throat> and I learned a lot of things at IE. Um, especially that life is really hard. You know? <laughs> we had to push patches to hundreds of millions of people all, all across the world, different languages, different people are still on XP servers pack one. We still had to support that. I'm pulling my hair out. Why? I don't know. Life is really, really hard. Get it on Patch Tuesday. It better get to everyone. It better be comprehensive. And you better not break the web. Right? And so what I would do is go home and be like, oh, man. Life is so hard, right? Life is so hard. No one understands the challenges that I have. No one could ever, ever, ever understand how hard it is to be me. But the honest truth is no one cares. <laughs> Nobody cares, right? You're like, really? Really? You know? No one cares. So at the end of the day, you're like, life is so hard. Life is so hard. But we want to be secure. I want to be the winner of the Iron Man. But I don't want to get on this treadmill for some reason, right? Well, you need to get on the treadmill. This is stuff that everyone is doing. You don't get to be the winner of the Iron Man. You don't get to be secure without running on the treadmill, without doing the things that security professionals do. Right? You just can't get there. And this is one of them. I'm not saying you have to do it every day. I'm not saying you have to do it every month. I'm not even saying you have to do it every year. But you better get used to doing it, because that's what security professionals do. And it's a mountain of work. And you don't just go straight to the top. You take it one piece of paper at a time. You take it one step at a time. You go forward one step at a time. And at the end of the day, when you get to a place where you can't go any further, 
you light the fire. You light this fire under someone else and say, why doesn't your product work with the way that I do security? Why doesn't your product work with the way that I do security? And then eventually enough people start asking, why doesn't your product work with the way that I do security? And those people start listening because you start going to places that will work with the way you do security. And that's that big chain, right? So you're not only doing it for yourself, you're doing it for everyone else. And eventually when everyone else is doing it, those people that matter, those people that you can't get to move, they will move because you're all linked together. You're all in this chain here, you know? And if the vendor doesn't want to do it, you guys all fail. If you don't want to do it, you guys all fail. Because remember that first slide? We don't stop. We keep going. You're not going to stop us because we're not going to fail. We're going to sit in front of our computers and we're going to own stuff, whether you, whether you just decide to subscribe to this or not. So that's my argument as to why you should do patching. Great. I was watching out for his kick. Okay, so now... Uh, now, uh, on, the, on the con side. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Actually, I won. I told him to go first. Like, give me more an extra time in order to work on things. But at least I've seen his presentation. All right. At the end of the day, I don't have a PowerPoint. I don't, got, I don't have a lot of funny slides. I'm an engineer. All right. And at the end of the day, security to me is a component. All right. To me, it's the reliability of my process that has the most impact on me, all right? I make a product. I'm paid for this product, all right? Other people use it. In fact, the electricity he uses to own your systems comes from me, all right? The chemicals that are used to make the laptops and the electronics, all right? The natural gas that heats his house, the water that he drinks, comes from me. And at the end of the day, the rest of the web can F off and die as far as I'm concerned, because I have to keep the lights on, I have to keep the gas flowing, I have to keep the water running. All right, I have other concerns. And when I look at security, all right, what, what, what ends up happening is I see a lot of changes. I see changes on my systems, I see changes in my processes. There are things that, at the end of the day, I know my vendor doesn't completely understand yet. And so all of these things add up to me as risk. Risk to my process, risk to my customers. Because at the end of the day, my customers need gas, they need water, they need electricity. All right. Some of the challenges that come from updating these systems, there's a lot to it. At the end of the day, we're not normal web users. All right. I run a power plant. All right. I don't sit in front of my computer working on Scrivener. All right. I don't web surf. All right, I don't move from computer to computer. I don't move files. I don't bit torrent. I don't do this. I don't do that. I operate a system. It is, while it is a multi-purpose computer system, it is a single-use computer system. So, and I apologize, I need some of my notes on this one. Now that I've kind of answered them a little bit. ICS operations has different risks and opportunities. What are our challenges? Maintain uptime. Always be in timely control of the process. Always be in timely control of the process. Remember Ralph Langner's presentation. 21 seconds was all it took to screw up a process. 21 seconds. How many times have you had to reboot because of a patch? How long did it take you to reboot? All right, what was your uptime on that one? What was your availability? 21 seconds can screw up a uranium enrichment facility. I can tell you this right now. If my timing's off on a turbine, it takes even less than that. Changes introduce risk, patches and AV signatures are changes. While our systems are often fully redundant, they are not currently designed to be cyber redundant. Maybe this is an issue, maybe it's not. But at the end of the day, I'm reasonably well co covered as far as mechanical failures and equipment failures and my mean time between failures. All right, I can tell you which bolt fails at which times. But I'll tell you what, I can't tell you what patch is going to fail on a computer and which ones are going to take down multiple computers, and I just don't know. That in and of itself is a challenge. But opportunities, they are single purpose, not multi-purpose. We have more limited attack services if you've done your homework and read SP 853, all right, and you're watching what's, what goes in and what goes out of your automation zone. All right, my attack service is much more limited. 
than your normal web server and even your normal organization. And I have a potential for significant isolation from these more wild networks. All right, my risk profile is already lower because I've designed my risk profile to be lower than a normal web user or a normal organization. I've also got a problem with AV. It's not particularly effective against rapidly developing threats. As far as signatures come down, it takes a while to get there, it takes a while to develop, it takes a while to test. And at the end of the day, my test loop as a control system engineer is significantly higher than your normal customer, i.e. any stupid web user, local user, or your normal organization. I literally have three rounds of tests right now. Maybe that's, an or maybe that's a process problem. Maybe that needs to be pushed down. Maybe that is the why don't you do cybersecurity like I want you to do cybersecurity. But maybe it's not. Maybe that's the way it is. As it is, AV signatures take forever to get down into my system because of the extra rounds of testing that go through. It's not particularly effective. All right, polymorphic code has a real fun time against antivirus. And there are unintended consequences to this. Who remembers when McAfee accidentally put out a signature update to all of their web users that broke their systems, put them into a continuous reboot that was caught by the control system vendor in their testing? They sent out an alert. Nobody applied them. Uh, I wonder if there's a plan out there that actually did apply them, you know, that weren't working with their control system vendor as far as that testing goes, and down it went. Continuous reboot cycle. All right, I think I'm out of time, Dale, am I? Okay. All right, let me see if I can, uh, if I can summarize a few other small points here. Ah, here we go. Timely control. AV slows my response times. Most times imperceptibly. In fact, 99% of the time imperceptibly. But when do you want your systems to work? That 1% of the time when they fail, when things are hitting the fan, when I've got alarms popping up on my system, when I've got things Turbines that are speeding up, slowing down. I've got oil moving here, moving there. At the times when I need my system to be working at its best, AVs can slow it to a crawl. And then there's that ugly feedback loop. The more things in the process change, the faster the ICS must work, the quicker the data must update, which causes AV to kick in more often, causing slowdowns. I just love that particular one. I've actually encountered that a couple times. But for me, I'm change averse. There are opportunities in ICS to make us a single purpose system, all right, and to design our system in such a way that, you know, while I can't exactly take the, the response, I'm not going to patch, I'm not going to AV update, why can't I select my times? Why can't I make an intelligent decision upon when my risk is and update at the time that it is most cost effective, obviously, less risk to my customers, less risk to my process, less risk to my equipment? Because I got a lot more going on than Twitter and Facebook and things like that. All right? I can't survive a reboot sometimes, especially if my systems aren't cyber resilient, which I will add to that. You know, make me a patch to make my system cyber resilient to this kind of stuff. So thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Oh, sorry, man. You guys, you guys can sit down. We're going to open it up and, and just... To remind you again, I, I, I don't know if they believe that or not, but they were taking the position that they, that they accepted and made it passionate, yes. So now they may argue the other sides, which is fine. But thank you guys for volunteering to do that. So now we'll just throw it open to the floor. The, the question on the table is, should antivirus and, and security monthly security patching be maintained in ICS or not? Thank you, Andrew Ginter, Waterfall Security. Um, I'll phrase it as a question, um, and, and I won't say your position. I'll say, how would the argument uh, against patching an antivirus change if, let's say, next week um, the uh, embargo came down on Iran and tensions escalated, and the week after, um, random IP addresses from every geography in the world started attacking uh, power plants and refineries using the techniques, the effective techniques of the Chinese hackers who've been, you know, stealing information from us for the last, you know, five-ish years. So two weeks from now, plants and refineries are dropping 
for periods of a day to a week or longer. How would the argument change? Who's up next? Let, let me throw something out there just to think about this, maybe twist your minds just a little bit, is as a security professional, you know, and I'm in the consulting business, so I have to have professional liability insurance. So it's very difficult to tell someone not to put a security control that, you know, 99.9% .9 of the world says you need. But does that mean that forever we have to do these things? I mean, I would think at some point you would say this technology, this security control is so ineffective that it's, yeah, at some point it's so ineffective it's not doing. At some point it may become such a risk, uh, a risk vector, an attack vector, because antivirus has actually been a way to compromise systems that it wouldn't be worth doing. And at some point that risk, and there might be a middle road where maybe it's not very effective, but the risk is growing. So that I would think at some point, some security technology would be abandoned. Or, or does it just mean over the years, you know, we got antivirus and then whitelisting and then whatever and whatever. So I, I think that's, that's kind of what led me to this topic is at what point do we start abandoning these things and, and taking other things? Yeah, Zach, to the rest of Well, to your point uh, exactly, so it, it kind of goes back to the uh, the lack of metrics, so we can't prove the efficacy of patching or not patching, you know, one versus the other. So it becomes, you know, one of uh, um, uh, Darren's, you know, witch doctor, urban, um, you know, myths kind of thing. You know, we, we patch because we've always patched, and uh, we can't prove that it's not effective. Um, but you know, one of the things Billy said though reminds me of, of how we've been seeing it though. You know, why can't we users, um, you know, do security the way we sell you this crappy product? Um, you know, so we're going to give it to you. We're going to patch it. We have to patch it again. Keep patching it, and it'll get better. Um, but uh, why can't the vendors you know, give us stuff that work the way we users want them to work is the opposite to that question. Um, speaking to, to Billy's point as well, but also I feel kind of taking a neutral position, one of the more interesting questions would be, can p patching function differently? Can it be done differently? Why does patching require a reboot? My Linux box can take updates and doesn't have to reboot. It's not necessarily the case that you can't do patching and have uptime on a system. You could be doing formal methods on patching. I, I've been waiting for someone to do this in academia and looking for an opportunity to do that with a, with a vendor for a while. Um, I'm not as good at formal methods as some people I know, but you could look at that as a way of solving this problem in the academic lab. How do you do patching without losing uptime? Um, and, and, you know, I wonder if questioning everything is part of the solution. Question how patching works and, and make it work the way you need it to work. Part of the problem is that we compare patching to the way Windows does patches. But maybe industrial systems need to do patching in an entirely different way. So I'd, I'd <laughs> torn here between whether I want to you know, build off of what, what Zach said and, and take the opportunity to talk more about voodoo and witch doctors and all that nonsense. Our, our, our passion here with selling snake oil to people that doubt that they need that snake oil. But I think really the issue here is, is a little bit more almost absurd than that, uh, almost more philosophical. We've been uh, we've been living in a world where we depend on systems to be deterministic, where we depend on systems to be rigid and perform in a highly predictable manner. Um, and the, the more we push that envelope and the more functionality, I mean, the more we push that envelope, you know, the more rigid the system gets, that means the more brittle it gets, the easier it is to break. Um, I would actually contest that we could make the system more resilient um, by actually taking some efficiency out of the system, some predictability out of the system, making it, ironically, a little bit more organic, intentionally. Um, the, the real irony here, to me, is that we're doing that anyway. By building all of this additional functionality into the system, we are making it 
more organic, making it change more frequently, making it less predictable, but we don't want to accept that fact. We're still trying to push it in this deterministic, rigid fashion, and as long as we want to keep pushing that paradox, we're going to be patching. Okay, who's next? Let's get some fresh voices. Who hasn't uh, commented on this? Ah, Jacob. Um, I, I think uh, one thing that I haven't noticed anyone touch on yet is until you've been in an operational capacity, you don't, you don't quite have the necessary perspective on patching and providing a service and being responsible for the uptime of the service. Um, I've never been a critical infrastructure operator, but I've been in an operational role. And when you have to deliver on an SLA and keep that service live and keep the money coming in the door, it's a totally different story and your perspective changes completely uh, versus security versus not security. So it's just, if you ever have the opportunity to get that experience, do it. Let me throw another question out at you. What if you are, what if you're only partially patching or slowly patching? You know, what, what would be the question if you say, well, I'm going to apply my Microsoft patches, but not all my other third party software patches, or I'm only going to patch quarterly. So that means two thirds of the time, there's probably an exploitable vulnerability on my system. Does that, does that change your answer? Well, well, it goes back to the, uh, the same problem, which is, can you guarantee me that this patch isn't going to bring my system down? Uh, can you guarantee me that if I push out this patch uh, uh, at my wastewater plant, and that it's, gonna, it's not going to brick this unit, and I'm going to have to tell Miami not to flush for the next 50 hours while, while Reed <laughs> puts back <laughs> at the PLC? I mean, this is, this is really the, the great fear. You're, you're absolutely right. There's a vulnerability here, but w but here's the question that I'm sure most facilities managers are thinking of: What is the greater likelihood, a hacker coming in and bringing my system down, or me bringing my system down? <laughs> and this is a real risk. Shameless plug: I've implemented successfully uh, change you know change management strategies within their except so call me, but. Uh, as a stakeholder, I think our responsibility is a lot greater than ourselves, and I think we need to kind of think outside the box. Uh, sometimes the company, uh, if, it, if it went down, it could affect the whole economy. You've got employees, you've got clients, you've got customers. Um, and I, I would say to any one of those stakeholders that you don't want to be first on the list. Sure. If, if, yeah, if you don't do those updates and there's a problem, you will be scrutinized to all heavens and you will wish that you at least said, hey, I did everything I could to protect the environment. Okay, I just wanted to get, get clear on which side you were going because you could have taken that either way. Introduce yourself. I'm Jason Holcomb with Lockheed Martin. Um, so I, I think, you know, back to uh, one of the arguments that, uh, that Mike was making is that you know, it's, it's easy for us to kind of look at this in a vacuum and say patching versus no patching, but I was glad that Dale brought up the, the idea of, well, is there a partial solution? And really, that partial, solu that partial solution is, really comes out of a, a risk evaluation. So, you know, these, these things don't exist independently, this decision of whether to patch or not patch, right? All of our systems that we've ever had operational responsibility for exist in the context of some business, and what does business understand? It understands risk. Um, and so there is risk of patching and there's risk of not patching and where you apply that, you know, to what systems, uh, sometimes it's going to come out one way and sometimes it's going to come out another. And, th and that's the reality of most environments that we're dealing with now. There's a certain level of patching that happens for certain levels of systems and there's, you know, some that, that, uh, that do not. And as we better understand that overall risk picture, like I think conferences like this are helping us better understand what is that picture and what is the risk and, you know, what is Billy up to, then we can make better decisions about what to do about it. Ah, good. Some new people. Fresh blood. Yeah, 
Sean McBride, Critical Intelligence. Uh, just following off what Jason said there, um, you, there has been some work done in terms of modeling to try to come up with what would be an, an ideal, obviously this is based, all, all models are based on your assumptions, but a, a paper I read a little bit ago by Miles McQueen, um, he said, hey, let's assume that you have so, you know, vulnerabilities that are being released so frequently and then exploits for those vulnerabilities that are released so frequently and then let's say that you always have to take in these assumptions that um, what is the cost to our organization to taking um, our process offline, how frequently does it normally go offline, and then putting those all together to try to establish um, an optimal patching rate, which is going to differ by organization, by process, and of course by what, uh, you know, what software you're running, those types of things that you're plugging into the equation. So there is some work that's being done to try to come up with an optimal idea and, and apply scientific thinking anyway to the, to the problem. Um, I, I'm all for patching systems, but I think the uh, the sort of unprovable or unanswerable question of can you guarantee that this patch isn't going to take my system down is a load of crap because nobody will guarantee that. And I think that argument makes the assumption that it's safe to deploy patches without testing. And it's, I mean, I think it's flawed to begin with. It, most most companies, uh, even in the ones that have patches or roll patches out on a regular basis, have a testing environment. Okay, and it's not up to the vendor to guarantee that the patch is going to you know necessarily work in all cases. So it's up to the individual company to determine the risk. You know what what's the likelihood? What's the threat? All those things are things that every individual organization is going to have to figure out. And it might be different even between different uh, different portions of the company. So you know, that's basically you, you gotta you gotta take it on an individual basis and do your own testing. And that's how everything else is done. Yeah, um, you know, I kind of have a unique perspective because I I actually worked at like a huge product and managed like a patching cycle when I was the one doing patching. And you know, you should ask yourself like, when an IE patch comes out, why does iTunes never break. You know, why does like Google.com never break, right? And that's because those things are in our testing requirements for Internet Explorer. And they don't pay us to do that when I was there. They didn't pay us to do that. We knew that if we put out a patch, we couldn't break those people. And there's a lot of places that do not get put on our patch cycle because they just didn't raise enough noise. Or to us, they just weren't important enough. You know, and if you think you're important enough, which I think you are, you need to stand on these people's desks and say, if you put these things out and you break us, you're, we're going to make you pay. You know, whether it's we're going to go to Congress or we're going to talk to someone or I don't know what you have to do. But get into these people's testing cycles. Make them do the testing for you. And that way, they can, they can never give you a guarantee. But at least at the end of the day, you know that it's not going to be something that's so obvious and it's going to break you just straight up flat on, to where you're on your back and, and you can't move anywhere. I mean, you got to do that kind of stuff, you know? Maybe you should ask your customers if you should patch. <laughs> They're the ones that are going to pay the bill, right? Well, I, I think, though, uh, I, yeah, but no, but I, th I think one, you bring up an important point, and um, it, it might have to do with the way the software and the, and the systems get deployed in that uh, a lot of the vendors, in the, and it varies by vendor, um, but a lot of them are semi-custom engineering projects as opposed to products and they have a real hard time testing them because essentially each one is different not not just the the load but they actually the the code is different and maybe that's a flawed way if, you, if you're going to sell pro, if you're going to sell software that integrates libraries and applications and operating systems that need to be patched maybe you can't build semi-custom stuff on that and, and expect to deal with it but I've held Robert off here, so let's Robert Pongren, uh, Roma. Uh, I think we should also take a step back and look at this problem. Um, I could agree that it's hard to patch an old system uh, which is built according to the old rules of building things. Like most of the things we find in this environment is like a box we did multiple PSUs because they are trying to, to fix mechanical problems. But I don't think 
that is an excuse to build a new system that isn't built like on two boxes that you could take down one node to patch that, while the, or, or triple boxes or quadruple boxes or something like that, because that's the way you should build new systems. But I still, still see a lot of things deployed in the field today where people have one box with multiple PSUs and things like that because of electrical errors and so on, and they can still not patch that. And that's completely wrong, wrong way of looking at it. So we have to look at this from an architectural view as well. And then we can say, can it be patched or not? Another point I would like to raise also is that we are focusing on like security patches now. But um, there's also other classes of patches like memory leaks and things like that that, that this also needs to be taken care of because otherwise you will have disruptions as well. So uh, uh, this is software we're talking about. So people have to smarten up and have to realize they have to change software from time to time. It might be security, it might be other things. And a third point also that is very worth mentioning, of course you could skip patching if you don't have the problem, if you don't have the software on it. And one thing I haven't really heard today is, or yesterday is the word hardening. So it, it was you who actually mentioned hardening when you were speaking about the kernel, but not having the software on your box, you don't have to patch it. So, so it seems to be an old school type of thing that people have lost and now we're looking for more security controls and new features like whitelisting. But another layer of security and defense is like, don't have the software on the box. I think, Sean, didn't, didn't some of your statistics talk about just patches in general, not just security patches in your presentation? Yeah. yeah. So if you watch that video, he does have some numbers in there where he says, here's the security ones, but then the vendors issued all these other patches. Now, I saw a bunch of hands pop up over here. So really briefly, I just want to say, as a QA guy who also instituted the patch testing cycle for our customers, made sure I could do it within five days and then automated it and made sure I could do it within three days to guarantee them that Microsoft patches wouldn't break anything or at least get as close as we can to that, testing is not the gold standard. You can go farther. So stand on the desk of the vendors, but also go back to academia and say, I want patches where you prove to me, proof mathematically, this will not alter the way my device functions, or it will not reboot at a certain moment. You can push research as well. And if you want to talk about the Microsoft patching cycle, they've got a research team that can do this. So you can go into formal methods as well. That's a step beyond just testing to prove it. Right. 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 And then, you know, that's why you have to push the research, right? We can now do formal methods in different ways with OCaml and functional. Anyways, that's another debate. Go ahead. I have to, I have to give him a right to talk because we don't know what he really said. It's fine. Yeah, to be honest, the eliminating patching and antivirus, I, I definitely do not fully believe in that position. Uh, I, I do believe in a, in a more sane method of applying patches to industrial control systems. And the best way I can think about this is that we do have non-security patches in control systems. All right, I can actually relate a story uh, that I do have to admit is second hand, but it had to do with floating point calculations inside DCS controllers. All right, and these were not handled appropriately. All right, and so there were some issues with certain logic, with certain methods uh, that were used within the control system and this patch needed to be placed. What happened was there was a full study. This is a high risk issue. It could happen at a certain time or any time. We're currently up, we're currently providing power to customers or we're currently providing water. I don't want to kind of set this up here, but the issue that we run into is, is that they understood the threat. All right, the threat was an environmental issue. All right, do we have a variable that's going to go into this range and come out of this range in this certain way at any certain time? The threat that we have here is a little bit more nebulous, all right, and more tough to define. No one seemed to bite on, on that question, so I'm, I'm going to throw it out again. What if you're not patching everything or often? Does your answer change if you're maybe, like I said, just patching the Microsoft patches, which, you know, I think in the community, that's what we see people attack first, uh, and probably for good reasons, but a lot of times they're not patching web servers and databases. You know, a lot of these have Oracle databases that go unpatched for years. Does the value of patching 
or d does your argument for or against patching change if you say I'm only going to patch six months and I'm only going to patch the OS? Or is that still something that's worth doing? Yeah, Zach Tudor, I, I think that in your original question, you kind of answered uh, part of your, your own question there is, as you know, professional, it's kind of hard to recommend against uh, a standard practice. But uh, if you, you know, make a regime where the risks are understood and the benefits are, are understood, then your customer gets the chance to, to make that decision. So you can give him both options. I can make a patching regime for you that is quarterly. And here's what the potential risks are. Here's what you'll save. Here's what the manpower will do. And then you know, ev everyone's kind of happy then. You don't you know, kind of go against the, the stream of uh, the tide. Um, but as someone said, yeah, there are still a lot of vulnerabilities out there um, that you will be you know, um, able to exploit. Uh, you have to have compensating controls. You know, everyone has to get a little bit smarter when they're not patching. Um, almost as smart as when they are. I have a couple of new ones, and we'll get back to you. Charles Brain from GE. Uh, just something that, uh, kind of based on what Zach said, and um, it would be interesting to see uh, patch uh, stats for the individual patches. So when you go through and you say, here's the risk, we know that 99.9% .9 of them you know, were successful, didn't require reboot, anything like that. So something like that from Microsoft or some, some of the other vendors would actually be kind of interesting. Uh, I'll actually try to make this fairly quick. I think, Dale, in response to try to answer your question a little more directly, I think Jason actually hit it pretty close earlier with his, with his comment about it being risk management. I want to ask, how often do you wear your seatbelt? Um, do you wear your seatbelt all the time? Is there some threshold where you decide, oh, I'm only going down to the convenience store. I don't really need it this far. I'm only going within my same neighborhood over to a neighbor's house. I'm going to put up with the dinger that long. Um, I mean, you know, you're exposing yourself to a potentially disastrous event for the benefit of some of a lot of instances of short-term uh, short convenience. Uh, I think uh, th there's another thing that's very important. Uh, like you said, uh, whenever a vendor releases a patch, patch uh, I think he should make sure of a few things. Uh, what are the options? Uh, so with the patch, they should talk about uh, workarounds. So if you don't install the patch, can you put a workaround there? Uh, that will be maybe much more easier to deploy. Uh, for a, for a certain a amount of time, uh, they they should be able to tell by looking at the patch how exploitable it is and how likely it is to be exploited in the wild. So we all know that hackers uh, they uh, they prefer some type of vulnerabilities over over others, or some will be much easier to weaponize than others. So those are the things that uh, we know about. So when someone releases a patch, it's not just a binary diff of the same set of binaries. It should, it should have a detailed explanation of the vulnerability. What versions of what components are uh, being patched? Uh, what are the workarounds if you don't install the patch? What are the mitigations you might have? You might have a certain uh, port not open at all, so it will not even, you will not even have to install that patch. It should have exploitability index. That's how we call it. Uh, it's a number from one to three saying uh, how likely do, you, do we expect this to be ex exploited against your systems? If it's a very low likelihood, it's, it's a very hard to carry out attack that relies on a number of factors like timing or you know, alignment of, the, of a set of parameters that normally don't happen. Uh, all this information should be included in the patch. So uh, don't think of patching l just... Uh, patching has evolved much, much uh, more than uh, what I'm seeing with some in some some patches in the ICS uh, field. It's not just here's the download link, go and install this patch. That's not enough. So that has to be improved uh, also. Hi, my name is Eric. Uh, I have a question related to the vendor's side of the 
perspective because uh, as a vendor you also have a liability of uh, the patching is uh, working and stuff like that. But how are the vendors dealing with all the customers? Because the customers are not all the same and different areas, different uh, criticality, and also do they have a service agreement? Uh, if they're not having the service agreement, do, are they also getting all the patching and the service uh, or they should have? I'm not sure. If I, you see utilities and users are not that aware, as we were talking about earlier, and they maybe they don't have the service agreement that they should have. So they are ending up with, with the unpatched systems because the vendors are not supporting them with that. Yeah. Commercial fry, CS yes, cert there. I, I may not necessarily even agree with this, but this is an argument against waiting to patch, like, oh, we want to go on a quarterly or yearly cycle. You know, when, when I was at Internet Explorer, those patches that you're most afraid of are the ones that carry a lot of stuff, you know, because you're making a lot of change, and those are the riskiest ones. And then, you know, when you bundle that with, oh, Windows is going out with a huge patch, too, and Office just happens to be going out with this massive patch, too, like, those are the weeks where you get really scared. Like, you know, we're doing testing and we're doing QA, but these are big packages, you know, and the risk is really high. And so that, that's one thing to consider. And, you know, maybe, you know, Microsoft is doing all this, you know, we're releasing five patches this month for Windows Office, IE, and they're all huge. Maybe we do that, you know, cross-compatibility -compat testing to make sure that all that stuff worked. But maybe other places don't. Maybe other places don't assume that you're going to wait one year and apply all patches together in this massive bundle, you know, at the same time updating all this other software on your system. And now you have all, this, all these weird possibilities that can happen. The risk has definitely increased. You know, and, and software, software manufacturers don't assume people are going to do stuff like that, you know, so not that I necessarily agree, you know, batching, and not that I'm saying that you shouldn't batch or that I, I'm making, you know, that I believe in that, but it's just something to consider, you know. Robert again, uh, on the same issue, the batching the patches, I know of places not uh, in the ICS world where, where they have also trying to batch the patches and sooner or later they end up in, in, in a mess where they say okay we have thousands of patches that are going to apply on our Solaris boxes on the Oracle uh, database and things like that and they really just keep pushing it because it's too much of a, of a change so they, they cannot do it they don't, they're too afraid to do anything because they really assume that it will, it will break and they will have a lot of downtime and so on. So it's like the, the kill of the thousand needles type of problem. Entertaining any, any comments on antivirus, it seems to have come away unscathed too here. But, uh, you know, it's, you've seen the race to zero. You've seen all these things about the effectiveness of antivirus and, and at what point do we... I guess one of the things I always like to do when, when, I, when I hear a consensus opinion about something is try to think, well, what would it take for people to change their mind and just go to that logical end? Is there anything that could make someone change their mind? And I, I kind of look at these things that way. One, one other thing on patching, though, um, so I, let's see if any comments on antivirus are very welcome, and pro or con, in keeping it. And then the other thing is on patching, what if your control system vendor says, let's say, 10 or 20 really important patches can't be applied. Do you still bother applying the other patches if your system is going to be in a known vulnerable state? I mean, the big problem, um, especially for critical infrastructure, is you're really afraid of Billy. Uh, I mean, and Billy is very good. And Billy has a lot of really nasty tools. So, uh, uh, and well, I, I mean, yeah. Well, no, he's also got a whole database of every vulnerability out there uh, available to him. And so I fix 50% of my surface area. What is my confidence level that Billy won't find the other 50? Uh, if he's good enough to get in into this supposedly air gra gap place, stay hidden, look at my system, have months of time on it, I mean, really, how uh, how confident am I that uh, uh, that the other 50% that aren't going to be patched uh, are going to be remain hidden? Probably not too confident. So I think that's a valid point. 
Um, the other thing I wanted to say was that I think if the goal is to increase adoption of patches and to make people more secure, you have to address uh, as the idea of uh, being able to reverse a patch. That is, in the very unlikely event and that the patch breaks my system badly, I don't want to wait 50 hours. I want to be able to do it ideally within like seconds and certainly minutes and certainly no more than hours, especially if it's a critical piece of infrastructure. Charles Perrin, GE. Uh, most of the engineers aren't afraid of Billy. They don't care. They don't know Billy. So um, they're afraid of a power, uh, you know, tree falling on a power line or something like that rather than Billy. Um, and to address the second part as far as reversing, um, virtualization is just about the best thing that we can do right now. Um, but other than that. Any, any comments? Oh. My name's Travis Bryan. I'm with Snapping Shoals Electric Membership Cooperative and uh, thought I might offer a slightly different perspective on the conversation. Uh, Robbie and I, I think, compared to most of you in the room, are, are pretty much the fleas in the group here, not from a lack of knowledge, but from the size of our uh, deployment and our network. Uh, we're just a small distribution cooperative. Actually, we're a fairly large distribution cooperative, but just a distribution co-op. And the conversation about to patch or not to patch is a very good one, and all of the academic uh, and esoteric arguments are, are good ones, and I, I don't mean to devalue them. But I have a LAN with about 200 workstations. I run between 50 and 60 servers, and when I say I do it, I do it. I am the server guy. I am the email guy, the SQL guy, the web guy. I am the firewall guy, the router guy, the the switching guy and when it gets to the edge of the LAN and goes to the substation Robbie's the guy <laughs> every substation every device every connection every fiber is Robbie's if each of those devices or each of my servers need patching over and over and over constantly I mean it's, it's just us man um, yes we should yes we know we should but it given, you know, uh, resource constraints, sometimes it just is beyond reasonable to expect that. So you do risk analysis, like I've heard, uh, not formally, certainly, because we don't have the resources to do that either, but you sit down and go, what do I have and what's most at risk and what's most important, and you try to get that low-hanging fruit and get it out of the way of Billy. Well, that, so that kind of flies in, you know, I'm going to, contradict what I said at the beginning of S4 where we should aim high and you know we should be we should these are critical infrastructures so we should be treating them that way but if you're not there yet you're focusing on efficient risk reduction right where can you apply your manpower resources your dollar resources to maximize your risk reduction so does that you know if, if you if you talk about a situation like they just described is that, is that where you put your money and your time? What? When are you not focused on efficient risk reduction? Well, that's it, a good point. But it, um, I guess when you have so little resources, the gradation between various options can be very easy to understand. If I do this, I get massive. If I do this, I get a little. I think people, I guess in our experience, people when they're just beginning to deal with control system security, it's pretty easy to outline the few things that they can do that will dramatically improve their security posture. As they get more mature and they've been had a program for five or six years, some of the decisions become a little tougher. Is, is this going to reduce risk more than this? So, uh, but like with a situation that they're talking about, is, is patching where they should be putting their emphasis if you're early on in your security program? And I'm still waiting for someone to bite on antivirus. Any takers? I've never had any problems with antivirus. <laughs> just, just, it, it, I, to me, it's never really posed. I mean, it, if you can in, keep antivirus up to date and you can work through the issues you have, you know, with performance on your machines, and you're still okay with it, that that's cool. But just personally, um, I've had no problems going moving around a network that has full antivirus implementations. So, 
just putting that out there. So you, just to be clear, what, about the effectiveness. The effectiveness, it, it's, you have to weigh the risk, right? I, I just, maybe I haven't ran into a really good implementation of it, but <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Right, yeah. It's for, it, antivirus is for the well-known things. Look at antivirus in general. It's signature-based, okay? It's for something they've had time to look at the patch, to reverse the patch, to, or to look at the attack and develop a signature for it, right? And uh, the, let's face it, they're not going to have a signature database that's going to cover everything that's possible. Keep them out of there. Brad Hager at Rockwell. So, yeah. go ahead. With that said, I do run antivirus. Oh, yeah, yeah, who doesn't? I mean, come on. <laughs> <laughs> but my point still stands is that it's, it's really geared toward the, the automated attack that's self replicating code that's going all, out all over the place. Because even with all the protections in place, you're still gonna, not going to keep Billy out of your system. Oh, uh, Jason from, from Dartmouth. Uh, as someone who has actually been moved to reformat their system due to a, an antivirus false positive, um, <laughs> I, 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 I remain slightly <laughs> I, I, I remain slightly wary of, of it, and I know it, the, the arguments are uh, you know it's, it's, it's essentially reactive. it doesn't you know you're not it's it's not the most perhaps not the most helpful of technologies but i i guess i i kind of sub subscribe to the defense in depth idea you know it's one more it's one more layer um at least on my system it doesn't seem to hurt it too much um except when i reformat yes and except when it claims my floppy drive is a rootkit file even though i don't have one or i don't have a i don't have a floppy drive not a root uh so it it's it, I guess it, it boils down to I, I I've seen kind of both sides I've seen patching help I've seen patching hurt and it's I'd like to say something unique but yeah I guess it's all about you know kind of figuring out what makes the most sense for you in terms of of risk assessment and and uh, crossing your fingers and hoping you made the right decision. I think that's a, an interesting contrast between what Terry said and what Jason said because Terry's like, I, I've, I haven't had any problem with antivirus, but if, you, if you're running one of these critical infrastructures, you, your margin for having problems is so small that if you, know, if you just have a problem, if, if you need to reformat a driver, all these things die, it, it really is a huge deal. So it's the, the consequences of this maybe tiny, tiny risk are, are, are large. I want to clarify when I say I have never had any problems with antivirus. I mean, when, I, when I'm doing a pen test, I've never had any problems with antivirus. I, I, I'm still on the system, so I'm still running what I want to run. And I mean, so occasionally it catches it, but usually that means you're running something that's old. And uh, that just means you have to go recompile it. OK, so let's, let's try to maybe, oh. Ralph Langer, I would just like to share some observations. Uh, first of all, around about 50% of my clients did experience malware outbreaks in their production networks, even though they allegedly had been protected by AV. How is that possible? Probably uh, because the AV product was uh, uh, insufficient. Uh, uh, probably the, sign the signatures hadn't been updated, which leads me to my second point. Um, it is, is a, it's a good idea to have some kind of AV and patching policy, but that's not enough. You've got to audit it. And my experience tells me that, that very few organizations really do this. Uh, so if, if you really uh, do a walk around audit and check the individual systems, you, you might be surprised how many systems are out of date 
in terms of AV signatures. And the same definitely applies also to patching. Uh, now, if we just exclude here for a second the, the one th point, I guess, that, that only Mike brought up, that there are so many systems out there that, that you simply can't patch because they're running on 24-7 basis, like in power plants. You, you, you can only patch once per year during annual outage, or the, the real productive systems. Um, so, uh, you, you got to audit. Uh, this increases your, uh, your effort that you have to take. This increases your cost. But unless you audit, I would say uh, this is just theory. And, and this, just, uh, this uh, won't get you anywhere. Uh, so, you really have to be strict on, on your policy. Um, and, and one final thought on this. Um, I have experienced more than once uh, in, in uh, corporations where you really wouldn't like to see that that uh, the company has some really decent policies in place in respect to patching and, uh, patching and AV, but guess what? They don't enforce the same policies to their contractors. So contractors are walking in and out with their malware-infested laptops, and nobody cares. Uh, nobody checks uh, what's on these laptops if they're running Windows NT, and, and I've seen that more than once. You probably will uh, be able to share these experiences. So uh, uh, my the plea is just uh, let's let's keep it real here. Let's let's try to prioritize the uh, the areas where probably uh, the the patching and the AV uh, effort uh, uh, would be most needed. And, and in my experience, this is in respect to the contractors. Any other thoughts before we maybe take a vote? <laughs> this is just to speak to you guys about. Um, being the little operator and feeling like you don't have control of the situation, you have so much to do, so much to patch. That's where you have to gang together. You know, um, when I was still with GE Energy, the customers came to us and said, "We want you to test those patches before we will deploy them on our system." When it was just one customer, eh, probably not. When it's three, four, five, ten, started to make a, dis a difference. So even though you might be small operators and feel like you don't have much control, when you club together with other people that buy the same products you can make a difference. Just one last thing. And I, I just, I'm sitting here thinking, you know, what about, we talk about redundancy in these systems, right? So you have redundancy. And then you look at how, like, for example, websites, right? There's a lot of websites that they, in order to run their business, they need to be up 24-7 as well, right? So they build a redundancy. They build a test environment, they test it, and they roll it out, and you don't ever see the, you know, you don't see the impact that is being talked about here. So I, I realize it's expensive and not a direct comparison, but just that when I, when I hear this, that's what I'm thinking about, right? There's other people that have this issue. Okay, so I, I just think this is a terribly lopsided debate. It's not a great debate. It's a lopsided debate. But let me just uh, just check here. So, um, is there anyone who thinks that uh, antivirus is no longer needed on your SCADA or DCS? Let's say your Windows machines. One. Oh, good. We got a couple. Uh, okay. So still the majority, and unfortunately my. Insurer is going to force me to recommend antivirus because of that vote. Uh, <laughs> because I, I was, I was, I'm, I'm like, I'm trying to raise my hand. I just, I feel so bad about antivirus that it's so ineffective, and I just see the level of effort and and the things that Ralph says. So it's done poorly more often than not. Um, even when they know we're coming for an assessment, there's still out of date <laughs> signatures. So I, I just. I don't feel good about antivirus anymore, uh, but I just can't quite get my hand up there. Uh, yeah, now we're going to do patching. So that was antivirus. I'm curious. The other question would be, you know, how many people are, are you know, again, I, I think it's almost a necessary evil because it's not a question of whether or not you use antivirus. I think it is on its way out, but, you know, is there, is there something else that can supplant it yet? We're probably a few years out. So that may be you know, a different question, a different way to position it. Yeah, and, and that, that goes back to the earlier comment. Are we just going to have controls on, so we've got antivirus, we can't, 
we say, you know, the room says we still need antivirus. Now we're going to put in application whitelisting, and that goes on. And then what are we going to put on next and next and next? I mean, Jason had a comment. Right. Well, just one more comment. I was going to say that uh, I think most of us realize that we don't run antivirus to protect against, you know, Terry and Billy or, or whomever, right? It's, it's a different kind of threat is the reason that we're running antivirus. And it's, you know, the guy bringing in the USB stick. And, I mean, most of us have been working uh, doing assessments and power plants and things like that have been around long enough to hear stories about, you know, the worm that gets loose on the control network. I mean, it happens. And, you know, having something in that case... Um, to detect that may be better than having nothing, and I think that's why we're stuck with it for a while. Even though I agree it's on the way out, I'd much rather see some uh, other technologies step in that are more effective and take its place, but yeah, it's the reality of where we're at. Okay, so let me, let me start with maybe an easy patching question. Um, I, I would guess that most people would say, well, no, the, that's not a question. That's a leading question. <laughs> You're leading the jury. Um, um, if you are able to patch your systems fully on a monthly basis and audit that that is successful, is security patching uh, worth doing? Does anyone, any, anyone want to say, no, that's not worth doing? Okay. Now, what if you're, now to change the question, what if you can only patch your systems partially every six months? So let's say you can only patch your operating system every six months, but you can't patch your Oracle database, your custom web server, and a couple other applications, is how many people think patching your operating system every six months is, is worth doing if you can't patch the other stuff? This should be a little closer. So we got... Is worth doing. Is still worth doing. A little higher with the hands so we can see them. Okay, so still about two-thirds there, I think. And, and were the other third not voting, or do the other thirds question whether it's worth doing or not? How many think it's not worth doing if you can only partially patch? So no one's putting their hand up for that. Okay, well, frame a better question for us. Okay, I'll do what I can. I mean, I think you, you hit the nail on the head with the risk management thing. And you've got two competing incentives. Okay. How do you balance the risk? Okay. Yes or no question? Um. <laughs> you, you, have, you have two risks. Let me just explain it first. You have, you have two risks, right? You have the risk of losing the process, which, which is an engineering risk, and you have the risk of losing the process to a hacker, which is a security risk. And we can't quantify how many attacks you're under, how many attackers are out there, and all that other stuff that we should be able to quantify as engineers. And that's where, that's where the, the problem lies, right? You can convince yourself that it's okay not to patch because you can't measure this other risk, okay. right? But you can measure the risk of losing your job because the plant went down today. Because you did something. <laughs> <laughs> or not, not Billy, not Terry. You. Uh, yeah, so I mean, okay, to put it squarely in, in, a, in question format, okay, um, you have a choice between... Uh, you, because of your limited resources, you have a choice between uh, keeping antivirus up to date and keeping your patches up to date on your system. Which are you going to do? Okay, so how many people, here's the question, how many people would select, if you could do only one, keeping your antivirus up to date, how many people would do that? And how many people would keep their patches up to date? I guess, the, I, guess the, the, I guess the thing that's a little unfair about that is the level of effort. Yeah, I, I have one additional question. Okay. Yeah, how many of your operators run, run with administrator privileges and can install any software that they feel like putting on the system? At that point, the only thing that's protecting you is antivirus because you can put patches on the system, but you can run any code you feel like. We ran into that. Okay. Does anyone else have a question that they want to put to the room before uh, we close off the great debate here? Okay, well, thank you all very much for participating, and thank you especially to Billy and, and Michael for being our advocates for their side. So let's take a 15-minute break, and then we'll have our last two sessions.